Over the weekend, the UK government faced a lot of criticism for the handling of the coronavirus thus far, with many critiquing not only the government's herd immunity approach, but also the ways it attempted to get the message out thus far. This was really highlighted by the fact that the health secretary wrote a piece for The Telegraph about the UK's coronavirus response, an article exclusive for The Telegraph, an article which The Telegraph put behind a paywall. The newspaper did later remove the paywall, but this, to many, exemplified the issues with the government's messaging surrounding the outbreak. In response to the critiques, the government announced that they'd be holding daily press conferences where the Prime Minister and experts directly update the public and answer questions from the media. The first of those events was held yesterday, and the Prime Minister took a somewhat different tact from previous press conferences. So in this video, we're going to explain the UK government's updated approach to the virus, as well as how COVID is set to affect internet access, airlines and TV licenses. Before we do, and I know I've said this tons lately, but all of our coronavirus content is being demonetized by YouTube. By some rough calculations, this has already cost us about £1,700, which isn't great when we need to pay for employees, an office, taxes, and all of the other associated business costs. If you'd like to help, we've just put up season four of our pin badges for pre-order, as well as a complete EU collection and a limited edition mystery pin where you get a random signed badge. Find out more about all of that by heading to our store. It's linked down below. Let's start with what Health Secretary Matt Hancock had to say to members of Parliament when he addressed the House yesterday. We now come to a ministerial statement. Secretary of State for Health and Social Care on COVID-19 update. Secretary of State for Health. Mr Speaker, the coronavirus pandemic is the most serious public health emergency that our nation has faced for a generation. The disease is now accelerating and 53 people have sadly now died. Earlier, I attended a COBRA meeting chaired by the Prime Minister to decide on the next steps in our plan. I can report to the House that we have agreed a very significant step in the actions that we are taking from within that plan to control the spread of the disease. On Thursday, we will introduce to the House the Coronavirus Emergency Bill. This bill will give us the powers to keep essential services running at a time when large parts of the workforce may be off sick. Some of these measures will be very significant and a departure from the way that we do things in peacetime. These are strictly temporary and proportionate to the threat we face, and I hope that many will not have to be used at all. As Hancock just said, the government will be presenting a new piece of legislation to Parliament on Thursday. We'll of course update you on that legislation package later in the week, so make sure you subscribe to the channel for more updates. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you very much for coming. I wanted to bring everyone up to date with the national fight back against the new coronavirus. As we said last week, our objective is to delay and flatten the peak of the epidemic. Today, we need to go further because according to Scientific Advisory Committee on Emergencies, it looks as though we're now approaching the fast growth part of the upward curve. And without drastic action, cases could double every five or six days. In a change since the government's last remarks on the issue, Johnson encouraged far more significant social distancing. The most impactful measures are applied to the vulnerable groups, people over the age of 70, those who are pregnant, and anyone who'd normally be encouraged to get a flu vaccine, such as those with chronic diseases. Professor Chris Whitty commented on this, saying that those are the groups who want to take particular care to minimise their social contact, which, of course, will have very significant risks for them. In order to protect them, Johnson said, In a few days' time, by this coming weekend, it will be necessary to go further and to ensure that those with the most serious health conditions are largely shielded from contact, from social contact, for around 12 weeks. But the isolation advice extended beyond people in the most vulnerable groups, with Professor Whitty advising that if anyone within a household displays symptoms, the entire household should remain home for 14 days. This is the whole household trying not to leave home for 14 days, trying not to go outside, even to buy food or essentials. Other people are still allowed to leave home though, 
but when they do, they should make sure they stay a safe distance from others. The government is therefore advising that if you can, you should work from home, and if not, you should continue with caution. The health secretary remarked on this distinction, saying that if you're healthy and you're not being asked to isolate because someone in your household has symptoms, then of course you should still go to work. It is important this country keeps moving as much as we possibly can, within the limits of the advice we're being given. Outside of work, all non-essential travel is being discouraged, with people avoiding unnecessary contact with others. Johnson has advised that people should avoid social venues like pubs, clubs and theatres. This is obviously a big change from the advice that was given a few days ago, and a big ask of the British people, something that Johnson reflected in his speech. And I know that many people, including mil millions of fit and active people over 70, may feel, listening to what I've just said, that there is something excessive about these measures. But I have to say, I believe they are overwhelmingly worth it to slow the spread of the disease, to reduce the peak, to save life, minimise suffering, and to give our NHS the chance to cope. I know that we are today asking a lot of everybody. This is far more now than just washing your hands, though, though clearly washing your hands remains important. But I can tell you that across this country, people and businesses in my experience, are responding with amazing energy and creativity to the challenge that we face. And I want to thank everybody for the part that you are playing and that you're going to play. The press conference wasn't the only coronavirus story of the day. And if this video is getting demonetized anyway, we might as well add in some other COVID-19 stories. Things already weren't looking great for the aviation industry, but with Johnson advising against all non-essential travel and the EU effectively shutting their borders, things are set to get worse. And this has already caused chaos throughout the industry. Ryanair and EasyJet are grounding most of their planes. AIG, the owners of BA, is set to cut their flights by 75%. Virgin Atlantic said that they'll cut four-fifths of their flights and have asked staff to take eight weeks of unpaid leave and Norwegian, one of the airlines most at risk, has cancelled thousands of flights and temporarily laid off 7,500 staff members. This is obviously terrible news for airlines, and estimates from the Centre for Aviation predict that most of the world's airlines will go bankrupt by the end of May, unless they receive financial support. This is something that Virgin Atlantic have already asked the government to do, encouraging them to support the entire sector. We'll see how the government responds in the coming days, but the virus has already had a devastating impact on the industry and the people who work in it. Another industry affected by the outbreak are the internet service providers. With people working from home, demand for home broadband is expected to escalate significantly in the coming days and weeks, leading some to worry that the providers may struggle to meet demand. This concern seems unfounded though with the ISPs reassuring customers that they have contingency plans in place to handle any increased demand. Mark Jackson from ISP Review commented that some slowdown in speeds during periods of truly heavy usage is possible. I'd expect this to be fairly limited, and that's true even in normal times. BT's Chief Technology Officer Howard Watson added to these remarks, saying that we have more than enough capacity in our UK broadband network to handle mass-scale home working. One last story to touch on before we go. As part of the government's wider agenda, they were set to get rid of the free TV licenses given to over 75s at the beginning of June. This would have required 3.7 million people to begin paying the BBC license fee themselves or face prosecution. This date has now been pushed back to August 1st, with the BBC covering the additional cost incurred by the delay rather than the taxpayer. The broadcaster commented that the BBC's priority over the coming period will be to do everything we can to serve the nation at this uniquely challenging time, going on to say that as the national broadcaster, the BBC has a vital role to play in, in supplying information to the public in the weeks and months ahead. This admirable move means that older people will continue to have access to BBC services, helping to prevent fear, misinformation and loneliness during the period of isolation. So that's all we have for now on the coronavirus. We'll update you more as the issue plays out, including any further government press conferences and the developments from Parliament later this week. 
be sure to subscribe to the channel for more updates and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we post. Special thanks to our Patreon backers whose support makes difficult demonetized times like now possible.